I love seeing your smiling faces. Awesome. We'll just give one more minute and then we'll get going. Perfect. Thank you all for coming. I'm excited. We're going to talk about fix that manuscript. And I've never given this presentation before. So you guys are going to have to tell me um, what you think. We are going to have um, questions in the chat. So if you guys have questions throughout the presentation, drop them into the chat. And I will do my darndest, or Cal will tell me if I'm missing some, um, to answer them all. OK. Still see people getting admitted in the waiting room. So I'll just give one more moment. Oh, I see everybody saying hello in the chat. Yay. Hi, Sue. Hi, Hallie. Hi, Doug. Thanks for coming. OK, more people in the chat, or more people in the waiting room. All right, we'll get started. And if they miss my intro, then that is OK. Um, so for those of you guys who don't know me, my name is Susie Vidori, and I am a young adult fantasy author. I am also an editor and a book coach. And so all of this information that I'm going to share with you today comes from working with clients as well as working on my own manuscripts. Um, I am the author of the Fountain series. So it has three books in it um, right now, which are The Fountain, The Westwoods, and Wall of Wishes that just came out in June. Um, the Fountain is actually about a 16-year-old Ava, and she moves from San Francisco to New England to find out more about her mom, who died when she was 10. And when she gets there, her reputation's preceded her, and the kids aren't very nice. And all kinds of crazy things happen to poor Ava, and she gets really upset. She runs into the woods, and she finds a mysterious fountain, like the one that's on the cover of this book. And she throws a coin into the fountain, and she makes a wish that one of the girls that she just met had never existed. And when she returns to the boarding school that she attends, the girl is gone. And not only that, but absolutely everything in her life has changed. Even her own family is different, and she has to find out about the magic of the school that she goes to and the history of her own family. She meets the boy. It's a romance and a mystery. It's tons of fun. And for those of you guys who were on my pitch session this morning, and I was telling you about my book, and I forgot like the most important part was the wish, um, that was a better edition of, uh, of that. Somebody says, nice pitch. <laughs> there you go. Um, so yeah, so what I w thought I would talk about with you guys is some of the um, things that I'm seeing in manuscripts. One of the reasons that I actually became an editor um, was not on purpose at all. Um, I actually became an editor uh, because I was experiencing that sometimes I was getting edits from editors that were terrific and amazing and taught me so much. And sometimes I was getting um, ones from editors that were not so much. And I was getting feedback from new writers that were frustrated that they weren't learning. Um, I've been in the publishing industry and in writing for about 10 years now. And I am a full-time um, author and do all things writing in addition to you know editing and all those sorts of things. So I did leave my day job as a vice president to do this um, because it became so much. But I was finding new writers saying that they were having trouble understanding um, and there's a lot of secrets or things that aren't really well explained in this industry um, that, that uh, I really wanted to share with people. And so I'm able to do that through editing and book coaching, which is awesome. So hopefully I'm able to put some of these things into words that are going to make sense for your projects. Um, so who here has a manuscript that they think is maybe done? Anybody? Okay, I'm looking, I'm scrolling through the list and everybody that's got their cameras on. Okay, so a couple of, like most of you have something or draft or something that you feel like is done. So for those of you who have a manuscript that's, that's completed, have, who here has had beta reader feedback, editor feedback, critique partner feedback, something? Okay, so just a few of you. So a lot less than you think um, that have an actual manuscript that's complete. And I encourage you, whether you hire an editor or whether you do it through critique groups or whether um, you do it through blue pencil sessions this weekend, I'm doing, I've done five already and I've got more to do uh, through the weekend where, so there's opportunities to share your work. I encourage you to share your work because it's very difficult to see some of the things that I'm going to talk about in your own work. So when I talk about them today, hopefully they'll tweak something and you'll be able to see it, but it is difficult to see it in your own work. And there's no problem with that. I mean, I, I read manuscripts for a living, but I still send my manuscripts out to an editor um, and I learn something every time I'm done. So Christy says she's close to being done. Somebody says it was done and now it's back to 50% and that happens. Beta is the next step, not even close to done. Yeah, so we're always at different stages of projects. And the more you go through your writing life, um, 
And you might have projects at different stages at different times, and that's okay. So this feedback that I'm going to give to you today um, is going to hopefully highlight um, book three in a trilogy plus a standalone. Awesome. Um, but there's always things that we can learn. So I really, um, my very first published book, which is this one, The Fountain, I actually worked with five editors and a book coach through that. So be like, what? Um, is it because I didn't know how to write? Maybe. Um, but it's actually because it took me a while to find a publisher, and so I shared it wherever I could um, with different publishers and agency, agents, and I got all kinds of different feedback. Um, so I ended up working through that process with a number of different people, and it made it a really um, awesome, solid book. So I was really, really grateful, and I've learned a lot. So I really value also my beta readers. Um, I keep them very close, so if people express an interest, especially in a series, um, I ask, I think, this time around for Wall of Wishes, I put out a call, and I had a Facebook post and I had 60 people put up their hands to beta read this book because I had that many readers that were interested. I didn't get 60 people to do that. That's not useful <laughs> because then you don't know what to, what to take, right? Um, but as a book coach, I actually provide project management as well as editing support and emotional support because for those of you guys who were like, oh, I had a project done and now it's at 50%, writing is hard and it's a roller coaster ride and you're kind of up and down. And uh, sometimes it's nice to have whoever that is that's helping you out, um, talk you through some of that doubt and tackle that with you because everybody has that, right? And everybody has those moments of imposter syndrome or doubt. Um, and your goals for your own projects will actually determine how much effort you put into it. So I meet with some, um, some writers and they're really happy to crank it out and write a book every couple of months and that's great. And they're not really looking for a ton of feedback. And then I write with, sorry, meet with other writers who really want to make sure that their books um, are everything that they are in their head before they go out. And that's a different type of writer. So take this, um, take these uh, suggestions and tools and use what you want, depending on what your goals are. So for this presentation, I don't want to focus on the basics of editing. Okay, you can get that from anybody. I'm not going to talk about punctuation. I'm not going to teach you how to write dialogue tags. I mean, these are all things. But I want to talk about the big picture problems that I often see with manuscripts and not the typos. These are the things that make a reader put a book down. Hey, they're reading along, and they're like halfway through, and then they put it down, and they kind of forget about it, and they're not willing to turn the page, even if they don't know why. Okay, so there's some science behind some of these things. And some of these things are a reason that an agent or a publisher might pass on your manuscript. Um, because it just didn't grab them, and they might not be able to articulate that. I'm going to try to point out some of the things that you can check in your own manuscript to see if it's working. They're really hard to put into words, and sometimes they're hard to pinpoint and hard to fix. And sometimes they can even be fatal flaws, but which means you know that you can't really fix them unless you rewrite quite a lot. Um, but finding them earlier in the process is a lot more productive than finding them when you're done. Um, so in this presentation, I'm going to go over um, some of the most common, common manuscript problems that I see. I picked ones that I thought would be really fun and some of the ones that are almost hidden from people um, so that I could share them with you. Um, and at the end of the day, remember that you are the god of your own book, okay? And only you can decide if you want to put in the work to make your writing great and if you want to spend the time to consider your reader's experience with your words. So if you decide to pay attention to these big picture items, uh, you can really create something magical. So, okay, so I'm going to share my screen here, and Calvin, hopefully this is going to work for us, right? It's going to work for us. I have confidence. Okay. You guys see my screen? Yes. Okay, so slideshow and from the current slide. Okay, so I chose some things today that I wanted to share with you um, that are things that I see all the time. And I'm going to go through these in detail, and I'm going to also give you guys some exercises to try with your own manuscript to see if you have these problems, or if you know that you have these problems, how you might be able to overcome them. So sometimes manuscripts just completely miss the point. Okay, um, I see a few people nodding. <laughs> so what is the point of your manuscript is, or what is the point of your story is something that you need to be able to answer, and we'll go through um, some of that. And if you understand what the point of your manuscript is, and depending on how you plot or pants or write, um, you might find this out early in the process, or you might find it out later in the process. 
Um, but it will really inform how you set everything else up. Um, checking for narrative drive, and I'll tell you what that means. Character agency. Um, so this one's huge in young adult, but it's important in, in all uh, forms of, of uh, storytelling. And I'll explain what I mean by character agency. And telling, not showing. And now that's backwards for a reason because I'm trying to point out problems. Um, and some of you guys might go, yeah, I know all about show, don't tell, right? And it's something that we've all heard a lot, but it's something that even, um, even those of us who've published a number of books, we still often, for the very first time that you go through a manuscript, you are, when you do your first draft, you're telling yourself the story for the first time, even if you've got a detailed outline. And so there is going to be telling and there is going to be places where you need to put in more showing. And I'll explain what I mean by that. And hopefully you'll learn something new, even if you've heard that a million times before. Um, so what is the point of your story? Okay, show of hands, who has actually ever considered what they are trying to say in their story? I'm interested. A few people, okay. It's not something that everybody always does, um, but what is the point of your story? Why are you writing it is a, is a slightly different question, but what do you want your audience to take away? What is the point? And what do you want to say about humanity? What do you want to say about the world? What do you want to say about um, people? I don't know what it is that you have to say, but it's always something personal. Um, and it usually sounds something like a bumper sticker when you get it right. So if you look at some common, um, some common books, the Harry Potter series, for instance, Love Conquers All, it's woven through, it's the point of every one of those stories, right? It's woven through every one of the books in that series, Love Conquers All. So every time, you know, Harry's faced with something that is way too big and he's not talented enough and he's not, you know, he doesn't have the skills, um, love wins that out, whether it's love for his parents, friendship, other and other. Um, so the point of the Fountain series um, throughout the entire Fountain series is be careful what you wish for. So there's consequences, right? Um, Every single book in the Fountain series, all three books, really have that at the core of them, that the kids are given absolutely everything that they've ever wanted, and that comes with consequences, right? And so, and so knowing that what you want means that somebody else doesn't get something. So if you guys have read the Fountain series, I don't know if you know that that is the point. I didn't know that that was the point until after I'd written the first book, um, but now I do. And so it helps a lot with shaping your manuscript. So take a moment and think about your current project and try a few things on. Um, if you're just planning out a project, what do you want to say? What's going to be the point of it? Okay? Because that will inform a lot of things, especially when you're in the outlining stage. So everything, and I mean absolutely everything in your book, must point to the point. Okay? So this means no side quests, um, which can feel really crazy. Stick to your point. Okay, and it informs your character's actions. So even when I, you know, I did seven blue pencil cafes this weekend, um, five of which have, I've already met with, but um, we're only going through two pages. And I can already tell sometimes um, that some of the things that are included, even the world building details, don't give us more insight into what they're trying to accomplish with the story. Um, so it helps you pare things down. So people come to me all the time and say, I have a manuscript and it's 200,000 words and I know it can't be 200,000 words. What do I cut? Well, take a look through and if you do a pass and you can see that some things aren't actually rolling up to this point, that might be a good place to, to actually cut. Um, you can weave this through your outline. So every scene should contribute something to declaring your point. And tomorrow night um, during the goal session, I'm gonna go through an outlining tool um, that I use from Author Accelerator and it's called the inside outline. And basically it goes through every scene in your book and talks about what happens in the scene, but what the point is, why is it there, right? And it's a really cool little tool that um, can kind of, you can look it up if you're not able to make tomorrow night session, uh, Author Accelerator, it's called Inside Outline. Um, it's a tool that's out there that I coach, but you can actually just look it up and, and work on it yourself. Um, but for every scene in your book, know what the purpose of the scene is and how it rolls up to what you're trying to do. Okay, does that make sense? Okay. Okay, I'm gonna stop sharing for a second because I need to see you guys because I can't see you. Okay, nod your heads if this is making sense. 
Okay, there good. I like it when you guys keep your um, keep your cameras on because otherwise I feel like I'm just shouting into a void. All right. So missing the point. So make sure you know your point. Narrative drive. So many times the manuscript, we, we feel like it's too long or it rambles. There's a lot of times when you need to take a look again at your narrative drive. So what that means is that every single scene that you have should lead to your next scene in a very specific way. And I'm gonna show you guys a couple of exercises to test whether or not that's happening in your manuscript. So a lot of times we have a draft and we know that it's not quite working. So for those of you guys who say that you have a finished draft, and then you say that you know you haven't reviewed it yet or you're not ready to pitch it yet or whatever if there's something holding you back you know that there's something take a look at your narrative drive um because narrative drive is what makes a reader keep reading so something happens but then something else happens and because those things happen something else happens that's going to make us turn the pages okay so this is called the but therefore rule and i like to use it um i like to use a lot of really short tools that aren't really onerous. I'm not a big story grid person. I mean, if somebody, if I want to, if I'm working with somebody and they use story grids and use like long onerous tools, great, if, you know? But what I really like to do is work with writers who, you know, want to write and who want to have some quick tools that they can test things with. And this is one of those little tools. So taking a look at each of your scenes and making sure that you can link them with the word but or the word therefore. And it actually comes from the creators of South Park, which is kind of funny um, because, uh, and there's a YouTube video out there on it. I can't share it during this presentation because otherwise our recording will get rejected from YouTube for copyright. Um, but the but therefore rule um, is how they actually made sure that the South Park episodes all had this narrative drive, that it kept going, that it kept the pace going. Um, so what it looks like when it's working is this. You have your scene and you say, well, something happens in the scene, but, right? Or you say, and then something else happens to sort of screw that up. And because this happens, therefore, something else happens. And what we don't want to hear, and what happens in a manuscript when you're lacking narrative drive, is something happens, and then something else happens, and then something else happens, and then something else happens, and you're missing those links that it's happening because uh, of the previous one. And that's where your reader's going to be here and they're going to read it and they're going to have to go. Oh, the phone rang and I have to go. And they're not going to go back and pick that book up because you've got a lot of disconnected events that aren't actually, um, that aren't actually working for your book. Okay. So, okay. And then another tool that I like to use to test your narrative drive is Pixar. So, I'm using some movies and storytelling. Storytelling is storytelling. It doesn't matter what medium you're in. Um, but these are some really awesome tools that they make available to us that they use when they're creating a new Pixar movie. Um, and this is a really neat one to do a really short and snappy um, pitch almost, or a back of the book blurb, or a really short uh, outline. And this is how it goes. Once, of a, once upon a time, there was something, right? Something that relates to your book. And every day, so this is your beginning, right? We're setting up the way that it is in the beginning in your story arc, how everything is in the beginning. We need to see this. So if we were to do Cinderella, once upon a time, there was a poor girl named Cinderella. And every day she swept the cinders from the thing, from the uh, fireplace and she served her stepsisters, right? And one day, something comes along that changes and forces your character into action. Something comes along that forces your character into action. So in the beginning of a book, we often, we need to see the way that the character is and what their reality is today. And by the end of the book, you should have a parallel scene that shows us how they've changed, right? So one day, she gets invited to the ball. And because of that, she builds a dress, right? And then, but she steals a bunch of stuff from her stepsisters. And because of that, they tear down her dress. But because of that, because she wishes that she had a better dress, um, the fair godmother shows up. And she makes a dress and Cinderella goes to the ball until finally she goes to the ball and she falls in love, right? And then there's a little bit more. And ever since then, she lived happily ever after. So there's a little bit more to the story, but at the very basics at the beginning, 
um, this is a really good test for if you have causation. So every day something, you know, because of that, and because of that, and because of that. And in a novel, you have way more stuff than just this. Um, but if you can look at your project today and you can actually put it succinctly into this, um, into this actual format, you will be able to see if you've got gaps. Okay, you'll be able to see if you have causation. Cool, yes. Ooh, we're maxed out at 100 people. That's too bad. Okay, so when we talk about lacking um, narrative drive and scene level, um, one other thing that you can do is when you're looking at your manuscript in a scene by scene basis, is make sure that each scene that you create actually has scene level conflict in it. So there's a big conflict, so we just talked about the whole big picture. We just talked about your whole book, your whole project, right? That's massive. Um, and I'm gonna just, just admit somebody that's waiting in the waiting room now. Okay, so we're talking about this whole big manuscript um, when we talk about, about the Pixar test and also the um, South Park test, right? But Individually in scenes, we also need to have that bit of causation, right? And scene level conflict. So in each scene that you enter, you want to make sure that your characters got little goals, right? To keep the people interested while everything else happens. So there's only three ways. So you come up with your scene level conflict and you look at your scene, you make sure that there's some conflict to keep us interested, right? We need like something happening, um, whether it's internal conflict or whether it's an actual fight or something has to happen. Um, and there's only three ways to actually resolve scene level conflict. So there's three ways. You can have the person achieve success with scene level conflict. You can have them fail, right? Or you can provide new information that helps them with their quest in the bigger event. So your, your scene should have one of those three things. Now, when you're looking at your manuscript as a whole or your book as a whole, you don't want to see a lot of success. Because if they're achieving their goals in every single scene, then your book's done. It's all done, right? You wrap it up really quickly. So there's going to be a lot more times when you're seeing failure than when you're seeing success. So they're trying to accomplish something in a scene and they fail, right? And that's okay because they learn something. And then because of that, they go on to the next scene. Or therefore, because they failed, they go on to the next scene. Or but somebody comes along to help or somebody gives them new information. Okay, does that make sense? Okay, cool. How are we doing? Okay, all right. And that leads us into character agency. So I feel like I'm just talking. So I'm gonna turn this back to you guys for a moment. Does anybody wanna take a stab at what character agency is? You can write it in the chat or you can raise your hand. I don't think you guys can actually um, unmute yourselves. Yeah, we can. Oh, you can, okay. Um, okay, is anybody gonna try it? What's character agency? Right, so Sabrina's taking a stab at it. Thank you, Sabrina. All right, so they actually play a role in the story and not just having things happen to them. Nailed it, right? That's exactly what it is. But it's really, really hard to see that in your own manuscript because you love them so much. So character can make decisions that influence their future. Yes, by Hunt. Thank you, Hunt. Um, so yes, absolutely. Those two things are exactly, exactly what we're getting at with character agency. So I'm going to talk about it a little bit differently. And I love this little picture that I, I found because this is what it feels like when you don't have character agency. It's like you've got this really cool guy. Look at this guy. He's got like a gun and a pirate hat and he's a pretty cool character, but he's got someone else guiding him. and He's not doing it himself. And so what do you think of that guy? Give me a thumbs up or thumbs down. What do you think of that little guy? Eh, yeah, right? He's not, he's not driving it himself. And so there's something when your reader connects with a character that you need to see that their actions are actually um, driving consequences. And I do this myself um, in my stories. Sometimes I forget to let my character lead. And you just realize it later when you're doing the scenes. But go through and make sure. Now remember, you, you know, you could come to me and say, but I have five main characters. Okay, you might have five points of view, but pick whose story it is because there's always one person whose story it is that we follow through. There may be subplots and other things, but there's always one character 
Um, doesn't matter what your story is. There's only one character that is the main character. So pick one and have the whole story, even those other subplots and characters, have the whole story revolve around them and their choices. Okay. So this means that your character needs to make all the decisions, every one of them, right? If somebody may, if something happens to them, they need to react. They don't just let it happen to them and say, oh, okay, they need to react, okay? Even if they accept it, make it a choice that they accept it because their fate needs to be a consequence of their decisions or your reader won't care about them. Your reader will just forget. So some of the ways that you can show this uh, character agency, um, number one, and I don't have it down here, but I should, number one would be to have them have a, have a goal. What do they want? This is something that should be in the first three chapters of your story, if not on the first page. Um, what does your character want? And you need to know that as the writer because it will inform all of their decisions and it will lead how, how they make choices in life, right? What is it that they want? And I don't just mean they wanna be a good person. That is not enough to drive an entire novel. They want to, um, why do they wanna go on this quest? What is their immensely personal reason and think about this in your own story. What is their immensely personal reason for wanting to go on this journey? Because if we don't know what that is as a reader, we're not going to go on the journey with them. Why are they willing to go above and beyond to actually accomplish or do things out of the ordinary that they wouldn't normally do? Why are they doing those things, right? Um, do they have a family member who's in danger? Are they themselves in danger? Um, is it for love? Is it like, what is their immensely personal reason? You don't have to tell her from the pages, but you, the writer, need to know. Um, and whether or not that's revealed entirely is okay if it's not. But if you don't know that, it's difficult to have them be making choices in every single scene that will bring them closer to that, right? Vocation. So a job, right? So this is something that is sometimes missing in characters. Um, we create a story around a character and we don't know what they're good at or what they would do in life. And this is especially prevalent in young adults or in, um, or in fantasy, which is both what I write. Um, because in a fantasy world, sometimes we forget to give them a vocation. And what that vocation is, is it gives them stuff to do, right? They need to have stuff to do. So if they're going to be, have character agency and be um, driving decisions along, and they happen to be a carpenter as well, or have an interest in carpentry, even if that's not their job, then you can have them build, you know, supports for things. You can have them, it, it informs how they see the world. And this is something, especially um, in young adults or fantasy, like I said, because they're often thrown into a quest um, where they don't have a real day-to-day -day situation and we don't learn that background about them. And then it becomes difficult to get to know your character and to give them stuff to do while we're waiting for the big stuff to happen, right? Um, so one example of this um, is also in fantasy worlds or in historical fiction for women. If you wanna write strong women characters and their whole purpose in life in some of these books, because historically this was true, was to be married, right? And so you've got this female character, strong female character, but she doesn't have a job because she's, her job in life is to get married or to be a mother or all of those things. And so it doesn't give her as many things to do. So you need to take a step back and think, well, if she wasn't in, in that world, if that wasn't her role, what do you think she'd do? Would she be a map maker? Um, would she be an artist? Would she be um, a cook? Would she be... What, what do you think she would do? And give them something that maybe they don't do, but that ends up being a hobby. Because will, then when you are in your scene level conflicts and in your scenes where, you know, maybe there's a little bit slower, it gives them things to do. Um, and that means that they can lead more often and it provide advice based on their own interests. Right? Does that make sense? Okay. So enough about vocation and women working, although that's very important. Don't forget, finally, in character agency, don't forget to let your character lead, especially at the climax. Um, so I've done this myself. I recently uh, finished a manuscript and sent it to my agent and she pointed out that in the climax, somebody else led her through the building and the tunnels. And there was absolutely no reason for it. Actually, the map maker example was her. She was a map maker. Uh, that was her hobby and there was no reason for somebody else to lead she needs to lead and it was an easy fix but sometimes it's something that we miss 
Um, your character should be leading, especially into danger, that decision should be there. Um, yeah. Or they can be dragged kicking and streaming and resisting it, and that choice causes another consequence, that's okay. Um, but they need to be making decisions about what's happening to their own person um, and not just handing over the reins to somebody else. Cool? Okay. I'm going to take a break for a moment and see if anybody has any questions in the chat. So I'm going to take a quick look if you guys have questions about um, agency or about narrative drive or what's the point, and then I'll get to show, don't tell. Because I think I'm going to talk about that forever. Okay. Um, okay, what do I think of character questions within the narrative, not in the dialogue? Something I see a lot. Um, so like, Madeline, do you mean, um, and I'm not sure if you're on the screen here, I've got a lot of screens to look at. Um, can you clarify for me, Madeline, do you mean like inner thoughts or questions? Like, what the heck am I doing here? Like that was not in the dialogue, but in the, in the, um, in the actual character thoughts? Is that, is that what you're getting at there? Okay, I'm gonna answer it not, as if it was that. Yes? Yeah, okay. Not, not, not in the thoughts. Yeah, no, oh, not in their thoughts. So what do you mean so, by so, Sort of like the, the author is asking these questions mm. aloud. Okay, so that is an It drives me crazy. <laughs> so that is an interesting point, and the reason that they're there is actually because the author's voice, in most fiction, the author's voice shouldn't be there at all, right? So if there is a question like that, it must be in the character's point of view. Um, right. Unless you have a, an omniscient narrator um, that's inserting themselves, and there are some styles where that's still acceptable. Um, one is like when you tell fairy tales or like children's stories, or if you're doing historical fiction, that is like wants to have that old tiny feel. But most fiction today, you will be in a character's point of view, um, whether it's limited or whether it's close. And so those questions should always be in their voice and not inserted in the narr narrator's voice. I actually um, just took a look at the manuscript um, for the blue pencils this weekend that, that did just that. And she was like, oh, as soon as I pointed it out, she realized, but it was introducing her character from like this third par party um, who was judging this character. And it was really cool. It sounded really neat. But then you're in the character's point of view and she would never have said those things about herself, right? So, um, so it's just something to watch for. Sometimes when we're inserting our own thoughts um, onto the page, those need to be taken out. Um, but you okay. can still accomplish the same thing and say um, you can have questions that are in your character's head that aren't dialogue. And you can just put them right in there and you can use a question mark, but they should be from their point of view or from their perspective and, and based on their view of the world, right? Okay. Um, okay, so here I'm just looking here. Um, we're a full room. Yes, we are a full room. Okay, so someone tells him exactly what to do. Okay, I don't, I'm not sure if that's a question, Barb. Um, oh, we like Barb's cat. Yes, I like Barb's cat too. <laughs> um, so, okay, any more questions here? Want, wants can change over the novel. Can wants change over the novel? Yes, wants can change over the novel. Yes, they can. Um, I would caution not to change them too frequently, and that has to do with um, that scene level conflict and resolving it. That's why I said there's a lot more failure, right? So if they really, really want something and you give it to them, then they better want something else, and they better want something else before you give it to them, right? So if you're gonna change what your character wants, you have to do it before you resolve the first one, because otherwise there's that moment where they're gonna say, oh, time to eat, right? And then you haven't introduced a new problem for them to want or a new problem for them to resolve. Um, so just be aware, you can definitely change it, um, but over the course of a novel, uh, or you can keep it be the same. But if you resolve that want, then create that new want before you resolve it. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, Character wants may not be what the character needs. Yes, very good point, Lou. I love this conversation, and that's part of character development. Absolutely. Um, I have questions. First, if there are other point of view characters who are not the main character, is it still important for them to lead and drive? So I'm not sure at what point you asked this question, but I did say that every book should really have one person's story, right? One person's story. So even if you've got other point of view characters with needs and wants, you want to choose 
one person's story that you're telling. Whose story is it? What's the point? Um, should really point to one of your characters. So you're going to have one that's more important than the other. Um, and so it's the agency uh, tied to that person is really important. Of course, while you're in a scene, if your main character isn't there and your other character is there, you can absolutely make them, you know, be the person with the agency. Um, but just remember to be aware of whose story you really want it to be. So even though in Wall of Wishes, I've got two characters. And so the fountain is, is one girl and the Westwoods is a different person. And Wall of Wishes is actually both of them. But it's still Ava's story because that's the one that people wanted to hear. So it has both points of view in it. Um, but it really resolves Ava in a, lot, a much different way. And she has a much stronger voice in, in this book. OK. I'm going to go back to the last one, and then I'm going to try really hard to answer all of the questions. But thank you um, for bringing them in. I just don't want to run out of time. Um, OK, so that's about character agency. I love all these questions. OK, so now I'm going to talk about telling, not showing. And I'm telling it backwards because I'm telling you um, problems with it. So this is my very favorite concept in writing. You guys have probably all heard of it before, so it's not new. I'm not going to pretend that it's new. I am going to say that even when I work with writers who've written lots of books or myself, when I send something out to an editor or to my agents, I get that note back in the um, margin, show, don't tell. And the reason for that is because, um, and I think I mentioned this earlier in the presentation, but really when you're drafting a story, the first time you create that draft, you are telling yourself the story for the first time. Even if you've done a detailed outline, you don't know all the stuff that's going to happen until you write that book. And that's part of the fun of it, right? Um, but you are going to have some areas that are telling and you are going to have to go back and find them. And you're going to have to create a showing. So there's actually brain science behind it, which is super cool. If you guys um, want to learn more about it, there's a Wired for Story by Lisa Cron. I uh, highly recommend that if you are interested in the brain science behind how your readers will engage with your writing. And that's what I would, that's how I would explain um, showing, not telling. So when you've done a great job and you have an amazing book, your reader is actually playing a movie in their mind, right? So they're reading your book, but they're playing a movie and you've given them enough detail to be able to see exactly what you're talking about. Um, so if you can see exactly you know, all those things, if you've got enough detail to create that movie in your mind, uh, then you've hooked your reader. And that's what makes them stay up all night and keep flipping the pages, right? Because they're entertained. If you haven't given those details and you tell them, it actually doesn't light up their brains in the same way and they get bored. So if I was, you know, just telling you all of this stuff or I just gave you these slides and I wasn't giving examples that pull you in and make you think about your own manuscript, you'd be way more bored than you are already, right? Um, so there's also a follow up to so that's for the um, for the actual brain science. There's actually a follow up to it that I think is an even better book. Um, and that's Lisa Cron's uh, um, Story Genius. And so if you're trying to connect the dots through the whole um, storytelling and figuring out what to change in your manuscript, it is an amazing uh, book to help you connect. It, it talks about um, those very deep personal wants that your character has and how to resolve them. Um, so I think it's a really cool book. Okay, so here's some ways to tell if you're showing. You are showing, which is good, yes. You are showing if action is happening in the present, not off screen. So if I am in your character's body, experiencing what they are experiencing, you are showing, okay? You're giving very specific details and actions. You're giving me enough detail. You're not saying, she picked up a couple of the things on the table. I can't picture that. There is no way for your reader to picture how I'm picking up a couple of things. I don't know what the things are. Um, so you need to be specific in some of those details um, so that the reader can picture it. Okay. So your characters should be interacting with your setting. So you don't want to give a big info dump about your setting. Right? When you come into a new world, um, new world, a new room, or new scene, you don't want to give us a, two paragraphs on what they're seeing. You can have your character actually interact with the setting. So again, we're in their body experiencing the setting, and that is showing. Right? And that avoids what's called white room syndrome, um, so grounding us in the scene. So if you don't give us any details, and you just start talking about what your character's doing, and we don't know where they are, the brain's automatic default is to imagine them picturing in a white room. And it's the weirdest thing. 
Um, because I read so many manuscripts, it actually happens. And I know when it happens because I'll be like, hey, they're in a white room. And then you write it down and you tell the person and then sure that whoever the writer is, um, that scenery is exploding in their minds. They know so much about it. And so as soon as I ask them, they don't say, well, I didn't know where they were, so I didn't write it. That's not the answer that I get. The answer is um, that they have this burden of knowledge. They know exactly what's happening in their book, but they forgot to put it on the page. Okay. So take a look and make sure that your characters are interacting with your setting and that at the beginning of each scene, you actually let us know where they are and who is with them in the scene. Don't dump it and when it is, if that's important. Don't dump it on the screen, but have your character somehow interact with it and let us know those things in the first paragraph or two. Okay, you know that you're showing if you're telling us what is in the scene and not what isn't in the scene. So this is one that's really tricky. Um, if you tell me that he forgot to bring his laser gun, he was really sad that he forgot to bring his laser gun with him to the party. I don't know, whatever that means. In your world, I can't picture it because he doesn't have it. You're telling me what he doesn't have, but what I'm not picturing is him being in the party and what he actually has, right? Now, if you were to pat the pocket and realize his laser gun isn't there, then maybe I have, maybe I'm back in his body, right? Um, so make sure you're telling us what is in the scene and not what isn't in the scene. And that's how you know that you're showing. Um, so the one about being, you know, action happening in the present and not off screen was a bit of a game changer for me. Um, so if you've heard that before, great. It was one that I didn't hear for the first couple of years of my writing career um, when you're kind of struggling with whether you're showing it or telling. Um, and so, yeah, if, you, if you're not actually in the scene, in focus with the person, um, then you're not actually showing. Okay. So I did a couple of examples, but I'm just gonna blow through them. But the book kept Claire's interest for hours. It was that good. Her feet had even fallen asleep. And when her mom finally called her to supper, Claire couldn't believe she'd spent the whole day reading about a trapped princess. So what do you guys think? Dump it in the comments there. Do you think it is showing or telling? Anyone, anyone? Who thinks it's showing? Who thinks it's telling? Yeah, it's definitely telling, okay? definitely telling. So it's easy to see it in somebody else's work, right? It's really hard to see it in your own work because you know what's happening in your mind and you are there with that person. Make sure it's on the page. Okay. Um, I tried again. Be nice. Claire's feet tingled from sitting cross-legged on the couch so long, but her hands kept flipping the pages of the book as if of their own accord. Her heartbeat thumped in her temples and Princess Arya was about to escape from the bottomless dungeon. Claire, your supper's getting cold. Mom called from the next room. Claire gave a start, her heart racing. She uncurled her numb legs from beneath her, giving them a shake. The hour hand on the grandfather clock pointed to six. The whole day had passed, right? Was that more interesting? Give me a thumbs up, okay? And the reason that it was more interesting uh, was because you're actually there with her and you're experiencing what she's experiencing. And it actually uses a different part of your brain um, than if I just tell you that. It's the same story. It's a little bit longer in this case. Um, and I kind of did that to prove a point, but it doesn't necessarily have to be longer. Okay, so that's all I've got. I wanted to point out to you guys, and then I'll try to get to all of the questions, but I only have seven minutes. Um, so um, I've got a couple more presentations this weekend. If you missed the pitch that story idea this morning, the replay will be up at some point today. Um, on Sunday, I'm giving a presentation on why write, and we're going to talk about why we write and some of these other um, things that can drive, uh, can really help you dig into why you're writing this particular project. And I've got some exercises to go through that might actually help you connect the dots on your own work. And then at 4 p.m. I've got turning goals into reality in today's 2020. So I gotta tell you guys, as a book coach, the number one thing that I've been doing um, since the pandemic hit is doing, I was doing goals calls in the beginning and I did, um, I did over 20 calls for free with people um, to just talk about goal setting because it is a crazy year and everything has changed and I'm going to share some tools with you guys at that. Um, so I'm going to stop sharing and I'm going to keep talking here and I'm going to look. She escaped. What happened to Princess Arya? Oh, you guys, what happened to Princess Arya? So she, my daughter's name is Arya, which I think Doug knows. And um, she was with me when I was writing that. So I put her in it to keep her interested. See, I involved her in the story and that um, created more interest for her. Okay. 
So Barb's saying the best way to understand what a story needs that isn't hiring a writing coach one on one and is actually preferred is critique. Yes, absolutely. Critique, critique, critique. Unless you see the problems as they exist in other people's work with the emotional involvement, you're not going to be able to see it in your stuff by far. Other people's unpublished, I think, work is a gold mine of learning opportunities and you get a novel slot that that's what you really need out of it. Absolutely, Barb. Um, critique partners are terrific if you've got people that have the skills. Um, then by all means. Um, when I worked with a book coach for the Fountain series, it was because I was working full time and I didn't have time to give to other manuscripts. And so for me, that, that worked out better. But certainly there's lots of different ways that you can get it. Okay. So are there any other questions here? I'm trying to look through here. Um, can, I talk, can I touch on the difficulty or challenges of making the villain the main character? Ooh, yes, I can. Um, certainly, but you have to make your villain likable still. So that's tricky because if your villain, and that's what I tried to do in the Westwoods. Um, so Courtney in The Fountain was actually the villain. Um, and then this book is written from her perspective and sort of gives you some insight into what, um, what it is that she's all about. Um, so yeah, so the villain in a story still has to become the protagonist if they're your main character. And what that means is that we still need to know what they want. And we still need to know um, who they are as a person and they need to be likable in some respects. I think some people never did forgive Courtney. Um, so I don't know if that was entirely successful um, from that particular standpoint because she was so awful and see Doug laughing there. But if she was so awful in the fountain that it was really hard to get over that. Um, but yeah, it, it's all of the same things. If you have a villain, you just have a little bit more work to do to make them likable and to make their story sympathetic so that people actually want to follow. Um, even in romance with the point of views, I'm not, I'm not sure what your question is there, Ivy. Um, sorry, if you want to send it to me afterwards, I'd be happy to, uh, happy to go through it. I'm just not sure what the question is. Um, what is the author of those books? Uh, Lisa Cron, so L-I-S-A-C-R-O-N was the books. And Wired for Story is the first book. It's really about the brain chemistry of reading. And then uh, Story Genius is the one that walks you through um, all of the, uh, the pieces that might be good connections uh, for how story is digested. Uh, it might actually help you uh, with your own manuscript. Um, oh, somebody else answered that. Thanks, Dan. Okay, 10 minute warning. Uh, what is your best advice for writing queries for nonfiction manuscripts for grabbing an agent's attention? So I talked a little bit about, check out the pitch, um, the pitch session that I gave earlier today. Um, I talked a little bit about that. Um, I don't know, it's kind of a broad topic, but writing queries for nonfiction manuscripts, I think you really need to put yourself on the page as well. So not just what you're writing about, but why you're the best person to be writing that book and show your passion and show your expertise. Um, because nonfiction, lots of times you need to be that expert. Um, so why are you writing that project is an important question. Um, do I consider flashbacks a method of showing? Um, I do, they're tricky. And as long as in the flashback, it makes sense. So your character touches this glass and somehow thinks about the fact that somebody gave it to her. So there's a connection. This is a terrible example, but you get what I'm saying. So there's a connection. They're not just flashing back for no reason. There's a connection to the present. And then have them experience that flashback in the moment. Make sure that you're still showing even in your flashbacks. Um, so it's as if your character's transported there. Obviously, they're not. Um, but if you can use those show-don't-tell techniques in your flashbacks, it will feel like you're really actually still there. Um, okay, just going to take one more quick look here. I might not get to them all. If I don't get to them all, guys, um, you feel free to uh, reach out to me. I answer all questions all day, every day, um, no problem for free. Um, I love talking to writers. so. If you want me to work on your manuscript, that's a different, uh, that's a different thing. But if you just want to ask questions, no problem. Um, okay, so what drew me to your panel this time was your sense about figuring out where to start with revisions. Any advice when you finish the story and you feel like you need to start all over again? So one of those things, um, thank you, Kelly, for your question. Um, I think one of the things I was hoping to um, put together in this presentation is really to give you some of those tools that it doesn't, it doesn't mean, um, 
It doesn't matter if you're at the beginning of your project and they'd be useful at the beginning of your project, but if you're at the point where you're not sure where to start and you know that something isn't working, I'm hoping that some of those tools will actually point you to that um, and you'll know, uh, you'll know where you need to do the fixes. If you think of something, if you um, really come up with your character's motivation or what your character wants afterwards, then you almost need to do a whole path and go through from that new perspective, if it's new, and what your character wants, and put that into everything that they do, right? And it might change how, um, how your character acts or feels or speaks. Um, so I'm sorry if I didn't get to your character or to your uh, questions today, but uh, we do need to wrap it up because I know that the next session will be coming onto this channel uh, very shortly. But I wanted to thank you guys. You can reach me at, I'm gonna put it back up here, um, my website is uh, suzyvidori.wordpress.com, and I am on email, and if you would like to, or sorry, on social media, if you'd like to reach out, and if you want to email me, it's suzyvidori at yahoo.com, and I'd be more than happy to answer your questions. I hope this was fun, and I hope it gave you guys lots of ideas on how to uh, work on your manuscripts going forward. Thanks a lot. See you.